Well, well, welcome to this talk. Now, today I want mostly to be looking at this paper here. Uh, ivermectin, a potential anti-cancer drug derived from an anti-parasitic drug published in the peer-reviewed journal uh, Pharmacological Research. Now, as you would expect, this wasn't published in the United States or the United Kingdom or Australia or New Zealand or Canada. This is actually research from China. So let's get straight into it now. Now, is there a plausible mechanism of action is the first question. Is it, is, it, is it conceivable that this could be true? Well, it gives various mechanisms of action in the paper. And we're also going to be looking at some specific cancers, which the researchers feel this is efficacious for. But let's start off with uh, mechanisms of action. Now, what they say is ivermectin induces different programmed cell death patterns in different tumour uh, cells. So this is the key thing, programmed cell death patterns. So what seems to be happening here is the body's own way of killing its own cells is activated to kill cancer cells, which of course is exactly what is required uh, in, in cancer to get rid of these cancer cells. Uh, the main form of uh, ivermectin-induced programmed cell death is apoptosis. So they're saying ivermectin is inducing programmed cell death. Now apoptosis is just programmed cell death so like when you were, uh, before you were born, you had tissue between your fingers and there was apoptosis of the tissue that was formed between the fingers. That's why you have separate fingers. So apoptosis is a perfectly normal process. It goes on in later life as well. And this is stimulating, according to these researchers, stimula stimulating apoptosis in uh, cancer cells. Uh, autophagy is another one, so basically self-eating. Lysosomal dependent form of program cell death. So lysosomes, uh, lysosomal, lysozyme is an enzyme inside cells that can destroy and digest cells. And proteolysis is, is an inflammatory based, uh, is a pro pro proteotosis is an inflammatory based uh, mechanism. Inflammatory cell death induced by uh, inflammasomes. These are components in the cytoplasm of cells again, which will cause uh, inflammation and destruction of the of the cells. So mechanisms there do appear to be plausible. And if you look at the paper, um, now the paper is somewhat complicated, I think it has to be said. But if you look at it, it talks about the different types of uh, cancers. And it also gives some plausible mechanisms in diagrammatic form. Now these are quite biochemical, I don't intend to run them through, run through them all, but um, they have plausible mechanisms of action that could be working here, for example. Uh, that one to generate uh, apoptosis and uh, another one here to generate uh, another form of cell destruction uh, or autophagy and they also have a diagram that illustrates potential mechanisms of action for um uh for the uh proteo uh, proteopitosis cell destruction so um not ludicrous at all, but of course the key thing is, does this work in real life? Let's just stop now. I want to play a short clip from uh, a cancer surgeon in the United States. This is uh, Dr. Kathleen uh, Ruddy. Some links for her there. She's a cancer surgeon, researcher, uh, an author uh, in the United States. Let's get her clip now and then we'll come back and think about it. <clears throat> and I was not really even familiar with those people who use ivermectin. Um, and so when, in the early days of COVID, when it became clear that ivermectin was effective in preventing and treating patients with a SARS-CoV-2 infection, um, I began to be aware, having looked in the literature, that there was 20 years of research showing that ivermectin had great potential in the treatment of cancer. I was introduced to a patient with stage four prostate cancer, had received two vaccines, perfectly healthy, marathoner, no history of cancer in the family. Two months after his uh, second Pfizer shot, he works for the government, he's going to lose his job and his pension if he wasn't vaccinated. Um, he was diagnosed all at once with stage four prostate cancer. He tells a very compelling story, melodramatic story about that 24 hour period of time in his life. And he went through the traditional protocols radiation, chemotherapy, radiation, chemotherapy, pharmacologic castration, all of it, over a period of nine months. 
And then his doctor said, you know, there's really nothing else we can do. And uh, his name is Paul Mann, and he was like, can't you give me more radiation? No. Can't you give me more chemo? No. Aren't there any other drugs? No. Are there any clinical trials? There's nothing. Hospice. Send for the priest. So a friend of his knew me, and she said, uh, would you give Paul a call? He just needs some moral support, something. So I said, sure. So I began calling him. We spoke about once a week for three weeks. And finally, um, the poor guy was suffering. He had cancer and 11 bones in his body. His right leg was completely swollen, obstructed with tumor. He's miserable. And I said, Paul, I don't know if this is going to help you, but I know it's not going to hurt you. I just can't imagine, based on my judgment and understanding of the scientific literature and all of the work that Drs. Corey and Merrick had done and others around the world, that ivermectin would hurt you. It might help. I can't say. So he said, you know, I'll give it a try. And uh, he drove to Tennessee where you could get it without a prescription. P.S. I discovered last night, having dinner with Paul and his wife, Terry, he drove from where he lives in Missouri to Tennessee and paid cash for his ivermectin. That's it. He didn't submit it to an insurance company. He didn't tell anybody back in Missouri as an oncologist, no. His ivermectin prescriptions are listed in his chart. How did that information get from the pharmacy in Tennessee to his chart in Missouri? We don't know. Somebody does. I'd like to know myself. Anyway, he starts taking ivermectin, and he doesn't have any problems with it. And I talk to him every week, and um, how are you feeling? Well, no change. Next week, uh, maybe a little bit better. I, I don't know. How's your leg? It's not quite as swollen. How, how's the pain? Pain everywhere. Uh, maybe a little bit better. Slowly, slowly, slowly. Not getting worse. Not necessarily getting better, not getting worse. Fast forward. Um, Two-month follow-up appointment at the clinic. They didn't expect to see him. <laughs> okay, he's like, Paul. <laughs> um, <clears throat> he's feeling a little bit better. They do a PSA, which was off the charts to begin with. And if I'm not mistaken, at the time they randomized him to hospice, I think it was in the hundreds, maybe 700, 800. What does that mean exactly for the layperson? Over four would be abnormal. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what are we talking about here? Prostate cells normally secrete a protein, prostate-specific antigen. Mm -hmm. It's one of the things that they do. Cancer cells that originate in the prostate that are dividing rapidly and growing fast are spitting out PSA, mm -hmm. okay? It's not that they're contributing to the body economy in any way. It's just they just want to multiply and divide, and that's the end of the story. And so your PSA levels start to rise, which is a marker, a screening marker. Oh, your PSA was four, and now it's eight. Let's do a prostate ultrasound, whatever. So PSA can be a screen for the emergence of a tumor, but it can also be used, particularly at high levels, as evidence for cancer, response to cancer, recurrence of cancer. His was, all, I mean, it's supposed to be, you know, four, you know, yeah, it's hundreds. Okay, he goes back for his two-month appointment. It's 1.3. They said, you're in remission. Well, not, you know, complete remission. He still had the bone mats, but you're in like a biochemical remission. Well, that was good news. Slowly, 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 he begins to improve. Less pain, swelling is okay. A lot of other vaccine injuries, however, he's getting better. He's getting better, giving him uh, some nutritional support and other supplements. So he's getting better, but nine months later, um, he's out dancing for four hours, three nights a week. He gets a head to toe uh, rescanning and uh, three of the bone mets are gone. There are no growth of the mets that are there no new lesions, there's only one hot spot, and that's where he received radiation therapy and the radiation, um, the radiologist really could not distinguish whether that was a tumor hot spot or radiation change. Mm. Um, he is doing very well. The vaccine injury is uh, a problem, but the cancer is no longer a problem except for the fact that it's still there and we want to get rid of it completely. Um, and, he, and he said, he called me from a hockey game, and he said, uh, if I didn't know I have cancer, I would not know I have cancer. 
Well, based on 20 years research, stage 4 prostate cancer, over-the-counter drug in Tennessee, and that's from a cancer surgeon, researcher and uh, author. So the thing about this is ivermectin is a remarkably safe drug. And if you're very ill anyway, it's hard to think of a reason not to try things that you might not normally try. And obviously what we should do, this is patently obvious what we should do, is people that would elect to try this should be free to do so, under the supervision of their doctors, of course. And a cohort should be generated and data should be collected. And if this was available, I think we would get a few thousand patients in the first cohort within a few weeks. Because sadly, we've got people around us dying of cancer now. We've So many of you have been touched by uh, cancer deaths. I've had so many uh, correspondence and comments on that. And, and um, tragic, I only mention this because it's now in the public domain, but Sir Chris Hoyer diagnosed with stage 4 prostate cancer. Uh, it's only 48, very poor prognosis with current medical treatment. A lot of this around... Why not try this and develop a cohort? Let's hope the regulatory authorities are listening and take this on board. It's just such an obvious thing to do. So um, let's just look at a few other cancers that this paper, remember we're looking at this paper here, ivermectin, potential anti-cancer drug derived from an anti-parasitic drug, data research from China, um, Other forms of cancer that are mentioned in this paper, breast cancer is mentioned, malignant tumour produced by gene mutations in breast epithelial cells, milk producing cells, digestive system cancers, gastric of course is stomach and uh, hepatocellular liver. Um, Again, they're mentioned in this paper with some evidence, why not try it, urinary cancers. Uh, renal cell, that's kidney cancer, of course, mentioned in the paper with possible mechanisms of action. Prostate cancer, as we've just heard from uh, Dr. Ruddy. Um, hematological blood, leukemia, reproductive system cancer, cervical cancer, ovarian cancer, again mentioned in the paper with mechanisms of action. And at brain glioma, uh, glioblastoma, very poor prognosis. Respiratory system cancers, um, nasopharyngeal, uh, nose and throat. Um, Lung cancer, melanoma of the skin. Um, And it's not just here. I've just included a few other papers. I'm not going to go through them all. There's a few other papers there with references that list these uh, potential benefits. Now, it sounds pretty far-fetched that one drug could be efficacious against cancers in so many diverse areas. But if if it is working in this way and it's... um, if it's disrupting the mechanisms of action, which I've misplaced now, um, but if it's disrupting the mechanisms of action that we mentioned, the, the apoptosis, the program cell death, the uh, the cell death within the cells, the lysosomal cell death, and the inflammatory mechanisms of cell death, um, then if these mechanisms are being stimulated and are killing cancer cells, then it's plausible. And in my mind, even without spending $10 million on a clinical trial, people that want to try this should be allowed to, not just people that live in Tennessee. And data should be collected and cohorts um, developed and their progress followed. This will cost essentially nothing. Um, If it's completely useless, in the vast majority of cases under medical supervision, the ivermectin is going to be a very, very, very safe drug, way way safer than ibuprofen, for example, um, or paracetamol. And our cohort could be developed and amazing things could be learned. Now, of course, the downside is that um, pharmaceutical companies might lose sales on really expensive modern patented drugs. So 
That's not all good news. Um, but in my view, there's just no reason not to develop these cohorts and make this available to people that would choose to try this. Let me know what you think. We'll leave it there for now. Thank you for watching.